Hi folks, let's make this. This is off one of a motorcycle bracket. I don't really know squat about motorcycles, but two lessons in this video. One, let's start thinking about speeds and feeds to push the machine for production. Then let's talk about work holding and fixturing and process. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. Half inch twist drill, folks. This is an extension off of last week's Wednesday widget where we talked about how hard can we push a drill. This is running 300 surface feet per minute, 10 thou per rev. That's as hard as I'm comfortable pushing uh, the twist drill, again, based on last week's Wednesday widget. You'll hear the motor is straining, and it's something I'm very conscious of but it seemed to hold up fine across having drilled all these holes. So yes, it's straining, and as it strains, I assume that means the RPM is lowered, which increases the chip load, uh, which is sort of an interesting downward spiral potentially. But again, it held up. Would I walk away or run this as I'm leaving for the night? No, definitely not. And backing it off, uh, what we found was even backing the surface footage down from 300 to 250, but keeping the feed per rev, that helped a lot for reliability of not hearing that motor just pushing right to the edge. But nevertheless, as we talked about last week, drills are an awesome way to remove material. So now we've got a pocket out at the top of this. We are using a 3 8 inch Taz tool from Lakeshore Carbide. As a roughing tool, the corn cob geometry helps reduce your tool pressure and does a really good job of making really small chips. We're doing a, a very unusual strategy for me here. So the feeds and speeds, 500 surface feet per minute. That's just about at the max RPM. Four thou per tooth, or about 61 inches per minute. The big difference is normally with adaptive tool paths and fusion, I'm cutting very thin width of cut and a deeper depth of cut. Well, right here, I'm only cutting 0.12 inches deep, not very deep at all. So let's kind of swap those two. And instead, we're gonna take a wider width of cut, 0.3 inches. I'd spent some time tweaking these settings because I wanted to get the cycle time down on this sort of decking pocket operation. And two minutes, I think is pretty darn good. When I started out, I think I was up to seven or eight minutes. And what you can see is it's a reliable process. We've got good chip evacuation. The machine sounds good, no chatter. I like it. And folks, I gotta say, this is what I love about the Tormach. The motion profile of the machine, of the hardware, of the path pilot control, I think this is awesome. This is handling that code, that adaptive code, the linking moves, the rapids back. This makes me really smile. I really thought this tool path came out well. So we do have a few of these pockets in this motorcycle bracket where you weren't able to drill the half inch drill. So there's not really a great option here. We could switch to a smaller twist drill, but I just went ahead and handled these with their own adaptive, using a quarter inch tool, max RPM, which happens to be 330 surface foot, three thou per tooth, so 30 inches a minute. The important thing is the helical ramp diameter and the ramping angle. Again, we were looking for that sweet spot. Uh, we wanted to focus on cycle time to kind of bang these parts out, but I also want process reliability. I don't want chips, uh, chip welding into that tool. This is though a long operation. There's just no two ways about it. We got it down to two minutes and 16 seconds. At least that's the estimate in Fusion, uh, which is pretty darn good. But you can see we're doing the rest of these holes, the majority of them together in only six minutes for a lot more of them. Okay, finally, we've got to blow the rest of those holes out. We're definitely using a 3D adaptive. Even though it's really only a two-dimensional or two-and-a-half-dimensional cut, I want the second tab geometry. I want this rest machining option. That's going to go through. It's going to recognize two things. One, it's going to recognize the holes that we've already drilled out to half an inch, so I don't need to cut air. It's also going to recognize the smaller pockets where I've already done my own adaptive recipe to get those out. So the result is you get the toolpath I want, which is a very efficient operation coming in, plunging straight down. Again, we're not having to plunge through material because we already drilled it out and just handling the rest of the part. Same feeds and speeds as the prior operation, same quarter inch tool, 
0.075 optimal load. That's a little bit more than I normally do. But again, I knew I had good chip evacuation because they were pre-drilled and I really wanted to push this tool and feeds as fast as I could. We didn't do this when we actually ran the part. It was a mistake, but we wanted to run these a little bit deeper just to make sure we pushed all the way through the hex pattern. And finally, a quick cleanup 2D contour. We slowed it down to a thou and a half feed per tooth just to give a slightly nicer finish. And a trick where you can stay half a thou above the floor. That way you don't happen to get that little pocket line or tool trough line around that perimeter. The idea with this part is it's going to go into a tumbler. And so that's okay. That means you don't necessarily have to go for the same level of fit and finish if you're doing a post machining operation, sandblasting or tumbling or shot blasting that's gonna help give it that good patina or the homogenous surface look you're looking for. Next week, we'll flip it over, show the fixture we make for it and how we opt to the part. So folks, I thought that went pretty well. A couple little lessons learned uh, from the cam side. And while I'm actually pretty happy with the cycle time, what I would do, and we talked about this in our ROI chip break that we just filmed, is focus on how you get it running on the next part. So I would probably switch from a vise, which has the problems of the parallel spanning, move to a, a talon grip or a pit bull, like the Fusion Friday we just filmed, with a little mini pallet. Even if that pallet is inside a vise, then you can just drop that pallet onto the vise, close the vise, hit go, you're ready to go. You can handle that uncertainty of work holding, the testing that out offline, or you could do the Pearson system where you could do pallets that go down on the vices. Lots of ways to skin the cat there. Hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed, take care. See you next Wednesday.